I guess I can start, right? I've used one minute, 20 seconds of my time already, or what? It's not started yet. It just says 120. I don't know what that means. That's one hour 20. Oh, that's what I have to talk. Okay, right. Okay, so, um, so uh, my talk is mostly going to be on the board. I was just going to show one or two sort of motivational movies. Uh, and I'm going to be talking about a kind of non-equilibrium system that we call uh, active. And uh, the idea really is that it consists of particles that are actually alive or that in a suitable sense imitate, suitable and quite limited sense, imitate uh, being alive. So, you know, obviously the, the big ambition is to try to bring uh, living systems and their constituents into the, the, the sort of the warm embrace of condensed matter and statistical physics. And uh, obviously we only made a tiny bit of progress in that direction. Uh, the, as far as the dynamical and statistical properties that we are interested in are concerned, all that really matters is that the systems we are looking at are made of components or particles or minimal uh, units, um, each of which carries a built-in and permanent um, times arrow. So each of them is continuously turning free energy into some kind of movement. And uh, what that means is that every effective degree of freedom of the system um, breaks detail balance. Okay? So it's not just that it's a driven system, it's a system made of components uh, that are driven uh, intrinsically. And in, I don't know if I have it in any of my slides, so I'll j say it here. We're really trying to talk about what Leibniz, I'm sure I'll get the words wrong, and even the spelling of Leibniz, I don't know if it's a T or not, we're talking about machines whose parts are also machines. I, I, I don't know if I've got the exact words right, but it doesn't matter, right? Uh, okay, and uh, so, you know, the kind of thing we'd like to talk about really, what we'd really like to know is if you see something like this, is there, um, you know, can you think of this usefully as some kind of living example of a liquid crystal. Because what you can see in this system, and I doubt that I really get very far, certainly not in this lecture, describing a system like this, but basically you've got objects, each object is powered, it's moving. For the most part, especially if you have a very big collection, much bigger than this, the things that are in the interior are moving in whatever direction they're moving in, mainly because they're trying to line up with their neighbors, and not because, not because, uh, they are necessarily are following a common queue. So um, it is a kind of spontaneously ordered state in collections of uh, living particles. Um, I'll also talk about uh, systems like this. So this and this are two examples of imitations of uh, living matter in which you have a particle. Uh, usually this happens, excuse me. You have a particle that you're feeding energy to in some way. In this case, what you have is you've got a horizontal surface like this, and you've got objects lying on this surface, and all you are doing is shaking the surface up and down very rapidly. Okay? So every, wherever any particle sits, one or many particles, each particle is getting some kind of energy put from the medium, okay? and it, by its construction, it is able to turn that energy input into directed motion. Uh, that energy input could be, as, a, as in this example, just me mechanical vibration, or it could be that you have a particle of this sort. Now, this, by the way, is totally macroscopic, some five millimeter object lying on a surface and turning mechanical vibrational energy into translational motion. You could imagine a particle that turns chemical energy into motion. And here is such a particle. One half of it is catalytic. You put it in a medium containing a compound that this catalyst will break down. The result of that breakdown is a built-in inhomogeneity along the surface of the particle of, uh, let us say, the reactant species in this medium. So what will, what will happen is that near the catalyst, the catalyst can, catalyzes the breakdown of that compound, there will be typically less of the reactant here. It will have been turned into product and there will be more of the reactant there. Therefore, there will be, along the surface, there will be an osmotic reactant. Uh, that will drive flow along the particle, and the particle will propel itself. Okay? So these are just 
very specific realizations of how you can make a particle that somehow drives itself. In this case, the claim that it drives itself looks a little suspect because you're driving it, but that's equally true in every single self-propelled or every single living system. We don't drive ourselves, we have food. And food drives us, okay? So in that sense, uh, don't think I have anything more, yeah. So uh, now you can, of course, carry this uh, description even further. Supposing you have, take, look at this gray square here, okay? So this gray, gray square is some two-dimensional metal. One face of the gray square is connected to a lead at a chemical potential mu r. The other face, the back face, if you like, is connected to a lead at a chemical potential mu l. Therefore, you're driving a current, normal, a normal current through this gray square. And now you can say, I've got this, you know, here's my gray square. And I just want to know about the physics in the plane of the square. So as far as the plane of the square goes, all it knows is that something is happening as a result of which every point of the system is perpetually in a driven state. And we want to know what is the dynamics of the degrees of freedom in the gray square, the dynamics of the degrees of freedom and how they move around in the plane of that square as a result of this imposed driving perpendicular to the square. So if you don't know anything about those, the, the two leads, you are a sort of innocent two-dimensional creature living in the plane of the square. You will run around apparently governed by laws very, very different from those which will govern dynamics at thermal equilibrium. So, um, yes. So I think actually I don't particularly want to distinguish that from driving in the following sense. I want to grab hold of some degree of freedom and subject it to driving and figure out what happens to the remaining degrees of freedom. In the nicest cases, in the cases that I would be most comfortable calling active matter, it really is a matter of terminology. These are all driven systems. It would also be a driven system if I had applied a gradient in the plane of that surface. Okay, the only difference is that then I would be picking the direction of motion. I would be breaking symmetries by hand. I'm taking advantage of the fact that this system has a lower dimension than the space it is embedded in, so that I don't pick any direction in the plane of the system. Yeah, so I mean, you know, uh, supposing the universe that we know for some weird reason, I think, I believe a Toft has speculated something along these lines, is somehow held out of detail balance for some reason that we don't understand. In that case, the dynamics in all the dimensions that we can see could be like that. We don't know, right? Okay. So, um, all I want is, I want to be able to study phenomena like, I want to study spatially homogeneous, spatially isotropic systems in which any ordering, any structuring takes place spontaneously but I want to do it liberated from the shackling constraints of being at thermal equilibrium, okay? So the way I do it is to introduce, you know, a kind of a deus ex machina going through the, the dimensions that we are looking at and um, uh, look at the resulting dynamics. Okay. Uh, pro hang on a second, let me skip all this. Ah, this is the wrong talk, so I'll have to draw it on the board. Yeah, so that's fine. I don't need, I actually don't need, this is not what I'm going to, my talk isn't in these slides, it's on the blackboard. So let me just see if I can uh, bring me back to, yeah, actually, let me do one thing. Let me pick one very, very simple example. So what we want to do is the following. Uh, let's take these two examples and I'll develop the rest on the board. Imagine I have a particle like that, I have a particle whose uh, center of mass position, who, blah, I forget which one is which. Yeah, whose center of mass position is little q, okay, and which has a little arrow. Now that little arrow could be, it, it could be that this particle is a timer, okay, and uh, I, q is the vector connecting the two ends of the timer, and little q is the center of mass. Uh, basically, what I want to do is look at a particle with a position and a built-in vector of some kind. Okay. Uh, by the way, feel free to stop me just like Bulbul did. It's much better to clear your doubts at an early stage than to uh, uh, you know, carry them with you till the end. So you can imagine um, writing down our dynamics for this particle. Now, normally, uh, if this was a thermal equilibrium uh, particle, then uh, and let us say it was placed in an external potential U. So I've got, let me rub this out. I'll start using the board. I'll, I'll leave that up there and 
I'll keep the slide on for the bit for a bit. So I've got Q Gov, is this big enough? You can't hear me. Huh? Okay, fine. And yes. So that's the central mass position, and that vector is Q. And let us say there's a put external potential. Then if I ignored inertia, then I just write down an equation of motion which says that Q dot is some mobility times the force. plus a noise, which for some reason I have forgotten to put down. And let me just draw this guy here. And uh, if I was at thermal equilibrium, by the way, when I say equilibrium, I'll always mean thermal Gibbsian equilibrium. Uh, and it could be that, the, that Q is a vector. You could imagine two cases. One where it's a dimer of fixed length, and Q is a unit vector, and all that Q does is to execute rotational Brownian motion. You could imagine a slightly different kind of particle. You could imagine a particle consisting of two mass points, maybe a big mass and a little mass, connected by some kind of spring, and that vector could still be Q, and the center of mass could still be little Q, but then it could be that Q isn't fixed in length, okay? It could be something that can fluctuate, okay? And what could happen is that it could want to relax. You know, in this notation, I've chosen a kind of ideal Hookean, Hookean spring with the equilibrium length zero. And I've said that the, ah, rats, excuse me, uh, Q tries to relax to equilibrium with a noise and little Q. Now, what I'm not on the blackboard, I haven't put in this term, but now I could. This is equilibrium. If I wanted to make it not equilibrium, what I could do is put in a little driving force in either case. Okay? So the picture here is, I've taken a Brownian particle, either with a fixed speed or with a typical speed, and I've written down a dynamics in which part of it is equilibrium dynamics, relaxation to thermal equilibrium in an external potential. Um, Q could either have, you could think of something even slightly more general than that. You could say that Q, you could have a potential energy function that depended on little q and big Q. And you could have that Q relaxes you could have little q and big Q relaxing and you could write the noise suitably and let me actually do that. times some kind of white unit white noise. The strength being buried in this coefficient. And likewise here. Times another noise with the same strength. Now, now I'm straying into territory where people can't read it, so let me write it here. This, again, is unit white noise. If I don't include the term V0 times Q in either case, this is just an equilibrium dynamical problem. I can put the problem out of equilibrium by introducing just one thing, just this. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
I think then it just becomes a matter of words. And you can certainly find systems in which, uh, I mean, let me give you an example. Suppose you had a non-tumbling mutant bacterium. Uh, you could actually have a system in which you put these guys in and they weirdly remember exactly which way they pointed and kept going. In practice, what it really means is that the rotation diffusivity is very small. Because, you know, actually what will happen is there'll be some random event that will take place to probably eventually turn it. So, yeah, I mean, it, that's a very singular limit which you might want to take. I mean, in fact, if you look at the movie I showed you, over the time scales of this experiment, it's probably not totally lost its way. So, all right. Um, okay. So what I want to do is to, I think now we can just, we can close the, put the screen up. So don't do what? Don't do, that's fine, I'll do it, yeah. I mean, I, I'll, 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 that's fine, but, and I'll disconnect this so I can use the board. Yeah, okay. So my, uh, I had of course stated some kind of, I think I'll drop this. I had stated some kind of lecture plan. Uh, I will adapt it to the needs of the moment. What I really want to do is to develop the story systematically. So my, I really want to quickly review dynamics at equilibrium. Actually, I have a handwritten plan. Let me use that. So, I kind of told you what active matter is. And what it isn't, more or less. Uh, and why it matters. Why you should care about it. Uh, because Dov told me this is what I have to do. So are you, have I told you about it or not? I haven't. Okay. Why it matters, you will see only from the results of these lectures. Okay. The reason we want to do it is that it is... So what do you mean? I'm sorry, you want me to tell them about the things doing amazing things? Yeah. That... Why did I even give him the chance to interrupt? Yeah, why am I doing this? Okay, all right. So what I really want to do is, I mean, this is the overall aim of my lectures, and hopefully by the end of the lectures you'll see it. But the way I'll proceed is a review of equilibrium dynamics. Very quickly. I'll show you how to build active dynamics. Um, I should give you a reference or two. Um, lost the reference, it should be here. So one place where you can read a fair fraction of this is There's also earlier lectures I gave last year. What's it called? Bangalore Statmex School? What do we call the... Hmm? You can, there's my lectures in this, which has some of this in it. Um, right. 
Yes? Sorry? Um, yeah. So I'll review active uh, review equilibrium dynamics, build active dynamics, and then apply the ideas. Since this is a school about entropy, and melting of a pneumatic, melting of an active pneumatic. If we get to it. Okay. So then I know I don't need this. So let's first remind ourselves of how we write down the dynamics. Okay, actually one of the, sorry, I keep doing asides. One of the points I want to make is the following. You saw this particle, right? The one that was sort of following its nose. You had a particle like this, which sort of went like this for a bit, kept going, but eventually... did turn around. So you have persistent motion. Plus noise. Now, you may, many of you may rightly ask, that's okay, but why is why should persistent motion plus noise be any different from what's happening with the molecules of air in this room? Okay? Let's remind ourselves before we start writing down equations in great generality. Let's look at equilibrium Langevin equation. with inertia. So supposing you have a particle of mass m, a momentum p, and a position r. Then you know that the equation of motion for such a particle and let's say there's some external potential u of r. That would be all if the particle was in splendid isolation in an external potential. But we know that we can model the effects of the fluid or gaseous medium around it by saying this. Right? So our starting point, if you like, is this. You know that if you have a one particle of mass m with a momentum p and a position r at thermal equilibrium, at temperature t, then you... So first of all, actually, how many of you do not... are not familiar with this? So all of you are totally cool with this, right? You can calculate Dov. Okay. I was just a little worried that you were saying you weren't familiar with this. Uh, so, can I take it that absolutely all of you have seen this, are familiar with it, or, you, or is it that you're so unfamiliar that you won't even react? Feel free to tell me. Can, can all of you do things like, how many of you can calculate the mean square displacement of a particle from this? How many? Uh, cannot, sorry. How many of you? Yes. What have I done wrong? No, no, no. This is rate of change of momentum. This is force. I'm okay. I, I think I've done it okay for a change. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, so I take it that everybody in this room can calculate mean square displacement, can calculate the velocity autocorrelation, all of that. Yeah? Nobody? Yes. What? You can't. Okay. 
All right. Um, uh, I think homework for the particular case, let's, let's give homework and we can discuss it in the tutorial. Homework. One without an external potential. Approaches show. And two so there's a lot that I do have to assume show that Where z is the partition function. In general, um, show a few of these things to convince yourselves that uh, things work that way, and show that x of r of t minus r of zero squared at long times. especially because I've got inertia in there, these results will only be true on the longer time scales. In order to get there, you'll have to deal with the shorter time scales anyway. So this is all, for those of you who know this, it's easy for those of you who don't, we'll sketch some of the results in a tutorial. Probably not today, probably Friday. Yeah, tomorrow or Friday. All right. Now, the reason I put this up actually was not so much to teach you about equilibrium physics as to pose the following question. One of the first questions we want to understand is this. We said that an active particle, the simplest active particle, the so-called active Brownian particle, is, is characterized by persistent motion with noise. So on long, so what it's, if you just looked at how it was moving, you'll see it going like this, like this, and wandering around and so forth. And eventually on long times, it will diffuse. You do get diffusion. So one of the things we'd like to understand is difference with respect to an equilibrium Brownian Brownian particle with inertia. Right? Is self-propelled motion for a single particle in the presence of noise merely sort of a minor variation on particles of inertia. Um, the second thing we'd like to understand is that given purely dynamical data, figure out or guess
So supposing somebody just gives you, you know, dumps their experimental measurements on the dynamics of some particle. Is there a way of being absolutely sure that this particle is in some sense alive, in some sense out of equilibrium, or not? So I'll try to say a few things about topics like this. Um, and a related question, I don't, know, I don't know if these are really questions that I'm going to answer in exactly that order, but uh, supposing you take that system I showed you, supposing you take, okay, supposing you take a general collection of particles that you are agitating with some noise, okay? If you look at just the position, you know, supposing you've got a surface and you're vibrating it and you have a bunch of little beads on it and the beads are sort of jostling around and moving around. Even though you know it's a driven system because you're pumping energy into it. Okay, so let's take a case of macroscopic particles uh, subject to noise of, you know, of which you are generating, not a collection of particles in contact necessarily with a thermal bath. Then what will happen is the particles will sort of move around, jostle, pump, etc. It's true that the energy they lose on collision with each other sort of goes off into the universe. So it's true in practice that the way you are maintaining that uh, state is by your explicit shaking of the system. Nevertheless, if you just watch the parts of the particles, could it turn out that an e effective equilibrium description nevertheless emerges? So we'll see examples where it can and examples where it can't, and we'll see, you know, kind of what kind of things you might want to put in in order to discover that. So this question and this question are a little related. This question I'm posing, even in the context where the particle doesn't have self-propelled persistent motion, just a collection of particles, you're energizing everything homogeneously, things are moving around in some way. Does it turn out that there is an, a way of uh, defining the, steady, the time reversal properties of the variables such that it acts like an equilibrium system? Mm -hmm. So let me see if we can cover some of these topics. Um, the first thing I want to do is to give you a kind of prescription, and that prescription is largely spelt out uh, in both these articles on how to build uh, equilibrium, how to build active dynamics from standard Langevin equation dynamics. So I'll keep that on there for a bit. So I just want to remind you that, you know, if this enterprise of building the statistical mechanics of active matter succeeds, you'll be able to take systems like that collection of millipedes I showed you, or like a tissue, or like maybe a collection of artificially self-propelled things, and build a phase diagram for them, calculate what happens, calculate if you find regions of, two regions of different density coexisting, why that's happening, and why in hopefully eventually the same sense as uh, thermodynamics. So that's the big aim. Okay. I'm always looking terribly worried. I'm using him as a kind of uh, indicator. You just sleepy? Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, so let's. Now I actually need my notes. So for example, as I said, supposing I consider, let me start with this problem first and modify it slightly. Let me first of all say that the particle, that the damping is so large and the potential is so slowly varying that I'll forget inertia altogether. So I don't need this equation anymore. I'll write this as okay. And just for convenience, I'll rewrite this as Okay. 
So I consider to my starting point is a particle with position R in a potential U subjected to thermal noise. Here's my particle. Now what I want to do is to build from this, you know, sort of take a lesson from this, that the kind of dynamics I'm going to write down is downhill dynamics in a potential, but I want to couple this to another degree of freedom. So what do I mean by this? I want to consider, this is my R direction. I want to couple this to some other direction, which I call a chemical direction. And just give me a second. I'm having trouble making up my mind about something. Let me tell you where I'm going before I go. Okay. I have a particle. It's moving in space. That particle is in contact with some external driving force. And that driving force you can think of as, for example, a chemical driving force. So this direction means number of fuel molecules consumed. consumed. What I want is that as this particle consumes one more and one more and one more and one more fuel molecule, it not only it's not only that the chemical coordinate advances, but it also advances in space. So I want to get an equation of motion which says that the net result of this particle being coupled to chemistry is a term here So let's, let's take an ultra simple case. Let's think, let's work in one dimension. I want to, I want to argue that in general, if I couple, I want to ask for the conditions under which coupling this motion to a chemical degree of freedom will result in a motion that is the original motion augmented by B naught. What does that mean? What that means is that the process of consuming the fuel couples to some internal degree of freedom in such a way that this particle ends up walking. So you've got a particle on a track and you put it through a chemical cycle. It eats one more fuel molecule, eats one more fuel molecule, and on average keeps moving in that direction. So we'd like to understand how that can come out of a minor modification of equilibrium launch my equations. One way you can do it, of course, is to take the equation and stick a term on here. But what we'd like to do is we'd like to write down the coupled Langevin equations for R and some other chemical variable. So, for example, So let me keep my notation consistent. So I've chosen R to be my chemical coordinate. Okay. I made the mistake of choosing a simpler description there than is here, so I have to get rid of some things from here. Just give me a minute. Okay. So I've got 
R, and let me introduce a chemical variable which I will, actually, no, let me do a little bit better. Sorry, just give me a minute. Let me do a little bit better. Let me consider my variable with a center of mass, which unfortunately are now changed from Q to R, and a relative coordinate, which I'm calling X, okay? So now I'll have R dot, sorry, okay, you'll have to just give me a second. This is, I'm getting muddled. Let me start from a more general starting point than what I've done, the reduced version there, all right. So I've got R dot equals derivative of H with respect to P. I've got little x dot, which is derivative of h with respect to little p, okay? I've got big P dot plus friction times derivative of h with respect to big P equals minus derivative of h with respect to r. Now I'll tell you what I'm doing in addition. Erasing before I can make this make sense. So what I have is I have H, which is a function of R, P, little x, little p, and a chemical coordinate, which I'll call N, okay? So this is my chemical direction, N. This in general, you have more than one direction. This is the, these are the spatial directions. Okay? So first I write down equilibrium Langevin dynamics of all these variables. Okay? So what will happen then is I'll have Guys, you have to give me a second. I'm suddenly losing track of something. Just give me a second. So let me, act, let me not try to take any shortcuts. Let me actually do the full, the full story as in my notes. So let's do the following. Let's first remind ourselves what the complete Langevin equations for a general system look like. Let's say you have a configuration variable C. Now, this could be microscopic phase space coordinates, or it could be any kind of coarse grained effective description that you've chosen, okay? So C could contain Okay, so let's say C is some vector, C1, C2, blah, blah, Cn. Some of these could be position-like, some of these could be momentum-like, doesn't matter, okay? The general form that your equation of motion would be, would take, and H is the full, the complete energy function of all these variables, okay? If it's a microscopic system, it's the actual Hamiltonian, if it's some reduced system, it's the effective Hamiltonian, which you can think of as a partial free energy based on co straining the system to some degree. Okay, in other words, you have... Okay. 
the general form of Langevin equations for these variables, for these, equa for these variables, will look like this. I'll fill in the blanks as I write the whole thing. Something. So now let me write this here. And so what we're doing is our starting point is the dynamics at thermal equilibrium at temperature T of a set of configuration variables governed by an effective Hamiltonian H. Now, this form looks a little weird, no doubt. What I'm saying is the dynamics has a piece which comes from a symmetric object acting on the generalized thermodynamic force, an anti-symmetric object, and a third term of this form. Now, I could motivate this in, in principle three ways. One, I could just remind you of a comparison. Let's, let's look at the simplest case, x dot equals del H over del P. If you have just an X and a P and a Hamiltonian, which is P squared over 2M plus some potential energy of X, noise, uh, which I had written earlier, we stick to my earlier notation. If you look at this pair of equations and this general form, you can see that this bit has, if you look at this bit and this part of the dynamics, that's like the piece coming from the antisymmetric bit. Is that point clear? Right? X dot is, so think of a matrix 0, 1, minus 1, 0, acting on the vector del H over del X, del H over del P, right? Then X dot will give me a del H over del P. P dot will give me a minus del H over del X. Yes. So this is a covariance matrix, and this is therefore a matrix. There's no inner product there, right? So this is just the whole, all the components. All right. Um, so I'm just saying that this form is a natural generalization of what I'm writing down here, and I will tell you little by little why this is the most general correct form. Okay. So first, let's recognize bits that are familiar. There's this bit. Then you notice that there is no damping term in the x equation, which you know because the relation between x and p is an idea. Where's my mic? Can you hear me? Hmm? No, it just sort of fell off my ear. Yeah. Um, the P dynamics, on the other hand, has a gamma piece, which is gamma PP, if you like, times del H over del P. There's no coupling of gamma, there's no symmetric coupling of gamma of P to X. There's no gamma PX, there's only a del H over del P term. So this is a term of this form with a very simple form. There's, there's no gamma XX, there's no gamma XP. There's no gamma Px, and there is a gamma Pp, right? So this is our gamma in this case. This is our W in this case, in this very simple case, right? Okay. Um, yes. Is the reversible dynamics of the, the reversible Hamiltonian dynamics of the original system is all it is. 
The only thing is that when you promote it to a general description of a, an arbitrary set of variables that you've... See, the point is actually, given a microscopic set of degrees of freedom, you can write down the coarse grain dynamics for anything you like. You can build any arbitrarily complicated object out of the original microscopic variables and build their coarse grain dynamics. In nice enough systems, you have an objective criterion for doing that, where you say you look at only the slow variables. Those slow variables could be slow because of conservation law, broken symmetry, etc. But in principle, you're entitled to do it for anything. Okay? You say, I'm going to look at everything slower than some time scale tau. Then everything faster than that time scale tau, you treat as instantaneous. And everything slower, you treat as the slow variables. So I'm saying that for any such process, any such projection onto your designated set of slow variables, you can write down a set of equations of motion. What you need is that given those slow variables, either you know, by empiricism or by general arguments of symmetry or by calculation from microscopics, you'll be able to figure out what this steady, the equilibrium probability distribution to the slow variables is. The importance of that equilibrium probability distribution is not just that you can write it this way, because you can take any object of this form and write it in this form. This guy generates the resulting dynamics of the effect, the effective dynamics of the slow variables. Right? The terms in the equation of motion are descended from this energy function. When you do that, however, if you try by pure guesswork to imitate this form of the equations of motion and say that, you know, the microscopic dynamics looks like this. I mean, the true microscopic dynamics is only Hamiltonian dynamics. But Langevin already told you how to manage the trick for the case where you look at one slow particle position and momentum in a uh, medium of other particles. He said, he said it turns out that all you need to do is to put in a damping like this, and a noise like this, and this agreement between these two will guarantee thermal equilibrium. For reasons that I'm sure you can all figure out or we can do for homework. Okay. You might be tempted to say, therefore, all I have to do is to write down, therefore, all I have to do is to write down Might be tempting to say that all you do is to say that you've got ci dot is equal to some. Now I'm writing explicit components, okay? Plus something like some Poisson bracket of ci with the energy function plus a noise. What notation am I using for the noise? I'm calling it ci, okay? You might think that this will do the trick. So, is that the equation of motion? Answer is in general, it's not quite. Okay? You will see that this form of the equations of motion differs from this form. Let me take this bit and write it slightly more elaborately as Poisson bracket of ci cj times derivative of h with respect to cj, okay? Thereby identifying ci comma cj with, uh, I've got this, yeah, with, with my present notation, there's a minus sign there. So wh what am I doing? I'm starting with the equations that we know and love. I'm trying to generalize that to an arbitrary set of variables constructed from the microscopic variables. And I'm asking, is all I have to do to write down the equations in this form? What have I done here? I've just taken this model, saying that damping should be a kinetic coefficient into the derivative of the energy with respect to the variable in question. The reversible part of the dynamics should simply be the reversible Hamiltonian dynamics inherited from the microscopics replacing the Hamiltonian with the effective Hamiltonian for the coarse grain variables. Turns out, it's not, in principle, that's not always correct, in the following sense. And now, how do I know that's not always correct? What I want is the probability distribution of C to relax as time goes to infinity to e to the minus And it turns out, in order to do that, 
I need to include this term. Okay, so you can take it as a purely uh, post facto fix. It is a much more general property than that. Okay, so I, I, have I lost you? How many of you are lost? Feel free to put your hands up. All right, so let me do it again. Yes. Say it again. Yes. Huh. From T? No, no, no. What I'm saying is this is standard Langevin dynamics. Okay. You can check explicitly for this case with the equations in this form that it will react, relax to the correct thermal equation. It will relax to probability of x and p is e to the minus you know, p squared by 2m plus u uh, by kvt. Okay? Uh, that weird extra term doesn't show its face. So the point is, I'm claiming to you, without proof at the moment, that if you try to elevate this to a general principle that we can always write down the dynamics this way, it turns out not quite. It turns out if you take a set of equations of motion of this, if you take a set of equations of motion of this form, where all you have done is by blind imitation taken this and written it here, and then build the equations of motion Now, I don't want to do the algebra of building the Foucault Planck equation with the Langevin equation right here. If you do that, what you will find in general is that this probability distribution contains. So, if you take this equation, build the equation with the probability, you will find it won't in general relax to this equilibrium. But if you put this term in, it will. So, that's one way of viewing it that this is a repair job. You started with microscopic, with simple Langevin equations. You said, oh, I can do this all the time. You tried doing it, and you ran aground. You found the, the this is called the Fokker-Planck equation, or this is, I guess, we'll just, I don't care what the chemists say. If you write down the Fokker-Planck equation for the probability, what you'll find in general is that it will not reach the correct equilibrium. And in order to reach the correct equilibrium, you need this term as well to be present. Okay? You can do better than that. You can start with a microscopic description and formally carry out a projection to cost-strained variables. So if you start with a microscopic set of all phase space coordinates and project, to a set of slow variables, you will find, let's call the slow variables something C. You will find equation, let's give this equation a number, I mean a, a label. You'll find So what I've tried to show you so far, so this actually is a good exercise. You can actually take an equation of this form, build the Foucault-Planck equation for this. Now the only part of that that you need to know is how to build, how to do the dynamics connected with the noise. So how many of you know how to, how many of you do not know how to go from Langevin to Foucault-Planck? Okay, one more topic for a tutorial. Okay, um, you all know how to go. All right, let me let me let me tell you that you know a little bit more of this than you may think. Uh, I can erase this. So supposing. I tell you that x at time n plus 1 is equal to x at time n plus epsilon at time n, where epsilon at time n is 
plus or minus some number epsilon. Okay, with probability half each way. Then you know that x will diffuse. If you then go to x dot equals then you know that have I got that right? Is that a four pi? Somebody in the room will know it. Okay? And you know, let's call this P of x and t, and you know that del p over del t will be d You know that if I add a little drift velocity here, then all that will happen this part is obvious right if my velocity is v then the probability current coming from that bit is v times p yes sorry ah this is diffusion and all i'm saying is if this then this. So, this, okay, if you want to know how to do this, you can actually generalize it from this, or we can do it in tutorial. You know that if you have an object taking a step to the right or the left of some fixed amount epsilon in a time delta t, you know that the position will diffuse. You know that, don't know that. That also we have to, I assume you know that. This is diffusion, yes. And this is diffusion because this is a random walk. And this is a continuous version of the same random walk. Okay? So what I'm trying to argue is, therefore, you know the contributions of the various terms in an equation of this form, rate of change of some variable, has a non-random non piece plus a white noise piece. All that the non-random piece does is to give you a velocity which depends on the coordinate in question. The current is just going to be the probability density into that velocity. The velocity doesn't have to be a constant, right? So I'm saying that this equation up here is of the form this equation can be written as c dot is equal to some velocity of c plus a white noise. But all of this I've lumped into a velocity, okay? And therefore, I know that the probability of C will obey a piece which is plus something. I claim that something you know from this elementary example elevated to this version in a continuous time picture to this. The difference here will be that my noise, whose correlator, unfortunately, I rubbed out, and for the time being, let's stick to the simple case where Remember what did I say about the noise? I said, let's take gamma to be a constant matrix, okay? Okay? Yes. I'm just saying, let me take all of this and call it the systematic velocity V. It's some function of C, right? So I've just called it V of C. After all, what is it? 
it's some stuff times del h over del c, some other, whatever it is. It depends on c. c is a big vector. So I can always write the equation of motion as c dot is a drift velocity, which depends on c, and a noise. Whenever you have anything with a certain drift velocity, the probability current is the probability density times that drift velocity. Because remember, the probability current is a current in C space. So I have P of, so the current is going to be P of C times V of C plus the Joseph piece. In the simple case of a, you know, one dimensional random walk, you can figure out that that diffusion part, that, that part will just give you diffusion. In this case, the only difference will be that the diffusion, there'll be a diffusivity matrix. So what you will end up getting, let me write this down by pure assertion and then maybe derive it during the, the tutorial. Let me write it down for that case itself. The claim is that Let's give it components. Okay. And let us, for the time being, stick to simple cases where there are divergence of that, that del <laughs> where this divergence is zero, or let's do it in the more general case. You can do either. You can just work through it, work through it for both cases and see that you actually get an equation. So if you take the V of C of this form and build this equation of motion, show that Now what we want to do, so this is for a completely general case, the, vec, the, the C equals, you know, it's a big set of variables. So at the moment what I'm saying is C, could, C includes the spatial variables and the so-called chemical variable. Okay, then what I want to do is I want to hold the driving force in the chemical direction constant and see that the end result is that you end up getting terms in the equations of motion for the physical variables which you wouldn't have got earlier. I mean, for example, let's, let's uh, again go back to an example, our old, our old friend, the dimer, okay? Supposing you start with a particle with a coordinate Q and you know, a particle with a position here, uh, center mass position Q and this dimer variable, capital Q. The question is, no matter how funnily shaped and how vectorial and anything this particle is, at thermal equilibrium, the Q variable won't start running in one direction determined by capital Q, right? I mean, you can have a particle that looks elongated, that's pointy at one end, fat at one end. If it's at thermal equilibrium, it won't start taking off in one direction because if it did, then you could extract energy from heat at no other cost, right? Okay, the question is, how does coupling to a chemical variable give rise to that drift term? So let's see if we can uh, demonstrate that case. Okay, so let us write down the equations of motion for that case. So let's, uh, imagine that our chemical variable enters very simply. You have a Hamiltonian which is H0 of uh, all the variables except the chemical variable plus what I'm, I'm going to write as N times delta mu. 
delta mu is just a constant quantity. And what it represents, you can see that if you, ah, so and n is the chemical coordinate. So proceeding, I guess maybe I should write this as, yeah. So I'm a little worried about the sign, but it doesn't really matter. This combination says that if I change the number of, chemi number of fuel molecules consumed by one, I change the energy by an amount delta mu, right? Delta mu equals change in energy if n is changed by one. If I eat one more fuel molecule, how much do I change it? So maybe in that sense, I should write it as minus n delta mu, but it doesn't matter. We'll live with it, okay? So what we want to know is now, now what we want to do is we want to keep delta mu constant. So first we're going to write down the dynamics of position, momentum, and n. Okay, write down the dynamics of, uh, so let's take the specific case where our variables C is one or more position variables, one or more momentum variable, and n. We write them as a column vector. And I want to write down the dynamics of x, p, and n. And I want to show that you get this drift. Or rather, sorry, I have to, not x, p, and n. I have to write down, it's a dimer. So, so dimer coordinates, dimer momenta, and n. In more detail. And let's Let's assume that the x, for simplicity, let's take the x variables not to have any damping piece, okay? Purely reversible. Possibly overly general, but let's handle it. Let us introduce an off-diagonal coupling between P and N. So I'll make this simpler in a moment. So this looks horrible. But let's see what we can do with it. What well, all I want to show is that the moment you introduce a term of this form, okay, let's just let's just work it out. Okay. Specifically, for example, let's take x i. Let's write them as x and little x. Okay, let's take this variable xi to be, what did I call it earlier? Q, no, let's x and little x. Think of these as the center of mass and the relative coordinate of the dimer. D. 
this term. So the crucial thing in all of this is that you introduce off-diagonal couplings which depend on the internal coordinate. So let's take gamma pn, sorry, no, no, wpn, where is it gone? Here. Supposing you take this to be proportional to x, okay? Let's write this as some coefficient times the relative coordinate. Then you end up getting plus a noise. So what have I done, apart from completely confusing all of you? I've said that within that general framework, supposing you have a vector of x's, a vector of p's, this is the equations of motion in fairly large generality. The only thing I need to do is to find some way in which the center of mass term in the equation, of center of mass momentum, will have a force proportional to the relative coordinate of the timer. So if this is my relative coordinate of the dimer. What I want is if the dimer, which I'll look, draw like this, has an extension in some direction, thereby defining a vector in that direction, I want it to get propelled. And my argument is that if that is to happen, it has to enter the P equation of motion through a term proportional to X. P dot is even under time reversal. X is even under time reversal. So this whole term is a coupling whose symmetry under time reversal is the same as P dot. That's it. Huh? No, no, I know it's not my phone. Yeah, yeah. So the claim is, if you simply introduce an off-diagonal reversible coupling, that couples the spatial momentum to the chemical force. Sorry, I didn't, my notation is bad. I should have said delta mu is del H over del N, which I have here. If I introduce a reversible coupling between the momentum and, this and, and the uh, chemical driving force with a coefficient which depends on the relative coordinate, that produces the desired driving force in that direction. Now, at the moment, if you write down the dynamics in this form, this is still completely equilibrium dynamics. If you hold delta mu constant, okay, so the only difference between equilibrium dynamics and active dynamics is holding this chemical driving force constant. If you let this, if you write the dynamics in this form, if you write it as Notation. And you write on the N dynamics up here, correspondingly, which I have not written. Now, if you write down the equilibrium dynamics of N, then what you have is you have a flat chemical landscape. You have the chemical variable moving back and forth. You have the particles executing thermal Brownian motion. All you do is if you insist that the chemical reaction go in one direction and you introduce a permitted coupling between P and N of this form and you hold this fixed at some value delta mu and because the object has a vectorial asymmetry, you say that a term proportional to X is allowed here. The end result is that you have found the term whose coupling to the chemical variable will give you self-propulsion. Okay, I mean, that is the level at which uh, this treatment works. So what it says is that you start out by arguing that if you've got a vector law, hold it, you drive it out of equilibrium, it will start moving in some direction. This tells you the way in which that out of equilibrium motion will happen. 
by starting with equilibrium, remember the important point I want to make here is this is equilibrium Langevin dynamics for a set of variables, namely little x, big x, little p, big d, n. In principle, I could even have introduced some weird momentum conjugate to n if I wanted. Okay? So you start with x, t, x, t, and n. Equilibrium dynamics. You build their Langevin equations. You allow off diagonal couplings. You then hold the chemical, so one, this, two, this, three, off diagonal kinetic coefficients, and four. And the end result is that if you allow the off diagonal couplings that de to depend on the various coordinates in the problem, for example, in this case, on the Daimler extension, then you find the equation of motions acquires or sprouts terms that you would not have had in the equilibrium dynamics. Okay? Uh, the important thing to note is that all of this, even though I'm introducing X dependence in these couplings. So all of, these, all of this is done at the level of a linear response theory because what you have is driving forces proportional to the force. I mean, even fluxes or dynamical processes proportional to the chemical driving force. You never go to higher orders. The only thing you do is you allow the coefficients to depend on the coordinates in question. So I never go to higher order than delta mu in any of this, just that I allow these guys to depend. So the picture, if you like, is that you have the chill directions, the chemical directions, and you drive this way, but because the landscape has some kind of cross-coupling which you can think of as grooves, if you put an object in this landscape and you try to push it in that direction, while being pushed in that direction, it also ends up getting pushed in this direction because the grooves mix the two directions. As a result, you get motion in the spatial direction due to pushing in the chemical direction. Uh, I agree I made slightly heavy weather of it, but uh, I'd be happy to answer a few questions if you like, uh, rather than do any more algebra. So in the next two lectures, I'll do the following. I'll discuss entropy production in active particle models. And in the third lecture, depending on how far we get to the entropy production, I'll talk about the defect-mediated uh, melting. Okay, so what hopefully I've convinced you of today is that equilibrium Langevin equations themselves, if you stretch a point a little bit and look at them in a situation where you hold a driving force at a small but constant value, already allow you to produce equations which had terms that you wouldn't have had before. I mean, take a, to take a very simple, this very simple example was, you had a particle which points in a certain direction. If you allow the, center, the, the equations for the central mass coordinate to couple to the chemical variable, and if you allow that coupling to depend on the, this internal vector, the Daimler vector, then you suddenly find the equation of motion of the particle has a term proportional to the Daimler extension. So you see, what will happen now is this you'll have p dot equals all the usual dynamical terms plus a piece proportional to x. So what does that mean? What that means is if my dimer is sitting like this, let's think, let's think one-dimensionally, okay? I, there may be some external potential, maybe other things. If my dimer is sitting like this, is extended like this, at non-zero chemical driving force, my dimer will be driven that way. Whereas at thermal equilibrium, no matter how much you extend to the driver, it won't couple to the center of mass and make it move that way. Okay? So is that clear, not clear? Confused? Is there a point I should go over, or is, there, is it so unclear that I have to go over all of it? So does anybody have a question, in other words? Yeah. Yeah. Say it again. Ah. 
Okay, so what I'm trying to, all, all I'm saying is the following. This complicated derivation I went through was simply to say, let me, let me just reiterate this little bit, okay? The way we're writing our equations of motion in this very general framework, we're allowing reversible and irreversible Onzaga couplings, as they're called, between the, amongst the dynamical variables. Every term in the equation of motion is a gamma or a W times an appropriate generalized force. One of the generalized forces is the force on the chemical coordinate, which is the derivative of the energy function with respect to the chemical coordinate. So what, what I should not have rubbed out, but anyway, reversible dynamical coupling between P and N times del H over del N, which I will rewrite as W P N into delta mu. Okay? Just using a different name for uh, del H over del N. Since my system is equipped with this internal vector x, I will consider the possibility of WPN being proportional to x. So I'll write WPN is some coefficient times x. Okay? Therefore, this term now takes the form minus zeta delta mu x. So what that means is, at any given moment, if the dimer is extended, in the, by some amount x, this thing propels itself by that amount x, okay? Now, that doesn't in itself make it a classic self-propelled particle. What it does, and we'll discuss this next time, is it, oh, I should have, though, what did you written here, police line? Let me keep it. So the effective equation P dot equals damping that you already had plus relaxation in the, in the external potential that you already had, right? Damping, relaxation in the external potential plus noise plus a term proportional to X. Now, what does that mean? Let's understand what that means by looking at the dynamics of X, okay? So I had... So I think we really need to do this if we want to understand this fully, and we can rub this out. And we'll close with that. X has a dynamics, which is X dot equals P by M. And P dot plus comma del H over del P. Let me write this X dot equals del H over del P. Plus noise, and we'll come to the noise in a second. Let me simplify my life by throwing away the inertia for the inner internal coordinate. Let me replace del H over del P by X dot. So X now has a dynamics in this, in its internal potential energy. You can think of two standard cases. Let, so let's think of del H over del X. Let's imagine the potential energy for X you can think of two possibilities. You can think of many. Some, one would be that it's just parabolic, in which case x will tend to relax to zero, but because of thermal energy will generally be spread by some amount. Okay? The other possibility is you could also imagine x being like this. Okay? Both possibilities lead to a kind of self-propulsion. Because what happens is this. You've got this dimer. If it is typically extended, it'll be somewhere, typically somewhere out here or somewhere out here. Okay? If it is somewhere out here, this thing has a, let's take, let's take this case. Supposing u of x is a half kx squared. Okay? Then what will happen is, Right? So what will happen is that you will have sort of X will usually have some RMS value. Right? 
Uh, I can be more detailed. I can give myself a noise strength and a, uh, here. So I can write this as root 2 kBT times little gamma times some white noise, in which case X RMS will be KT over the spring constant. Right? If you assume X sort of relaxes relatively quickly, then typically what will happen is your dimer will be extended this way or this way. Let's think of it, it's kind of a weird imaginary dimer where the internal, you've got an object with two ends, but the two ends can kind of go through each other or go over each other or something, okay? So dimer can be extended this way or this way, okay? So dimer is extended by a typical amount of that much of, it's gone, where is it? I seem to have lost it. Oh, it's there. Excuse me. Yeah, it's KBT over. Okay. By some typical amount, KBT over spring constant. Okay. So what will happen is you'll have this object, and at a given moment, it's sort of extended like that. It's trying to relax back. But when it's extended like this, it'll start running this way. Okay. And of course, X is relaxing back. And so typically what this object will do is it'll persistently move in one direction for how long? The time scale is also here. it will persistently move in the same direction for a time of order gamma over k. Because the x-coordinate has an RMS value of this much, and it sort of relaxes to equilibrium from an initial big excursion in a time scale of order that much. So this object acts like a self-propelled particle with a drift speed which is given by X RMS, so, and a sort of typical decorrelation time you can do something more fancy, you can have a potential like this. So then what will happen is the particle will, especially if these are deep, the particle will typically be out here or out here. Okay, so the difference is that in this case, the velocity distribution uh, will be peaked at zero, but you will still have velocities that turn around. Here, the velocity distribution will be peaked at plus minus this value. Yes? Okay, so, so this is what I meant by saying that the moment you introduce a coupling of the spatial coordinates to the chemistry through this term, if you allow this guy to depend, for example, in this case, on the internal coordinate, then what happens is, once del h over del n is held constant, and introduce the simplest possible dependence here, namely linear, the equation of motion acquires a new term that you wouldn't have got in equilibrium dynamics. And the reason you wouldn't have got it is you had to hold this chemical driving force constant, and you sprout this term. This is the very simplest of the possible new terms you could get. And certainly, if by pure thought you were to write down the equations of motion for an active dimer, you would write down something like this. You'd say, well, if the dimer is extended that way and it's out of equilibrium, then it knows the difference between that way and this way. So it should start moving that way. Okay? This tells you how that can come out of fundamental Langevin equation dynamics, provided you allow off-diagonal kinetic coefficients and you allow those off-diagonal kinetic coefficients to depend on the coordinates in the problem. Okay? So I admit that I gave an overly general construction of the equations of motion, but that is to somehow emphasize the great generality of it. The two cases you want to take away are that for a problem of a dimer moving in any internal potential, these two being the two simplest paradigmatic examples, you can get this term proportional to x is what applies to this. Here, of course, the, um, you know, you have to write down uh, nah, it's all right, in either case, it's good enough. It's still proportional to x. This form of the dynamics holds in both cases. The difference, the, the case I've written down here, the statistics and relaxation of x is for this case. You can write down a similar statistics and relaxation for x in this uh, bistable potential as well. This will give you something that's 
more like a really persistent particle with a well-defined speed given by that value. OK? So that's what I want to say. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. No, the off, it doesn't give rise to off-diagonal terms. If, you, if ever you want a machine in which some chemical reaction drives you in a spatial direction, you have to have a coupling, you have to have a kinetic coupling between the chemical process, between the process of consuming one more chemical mo chemis fuel molecule, and your spatial degrees of freedom. So the off-diagonal coupling, if you like, is a theoretician's way of writing down the fact that there, there is this coupling. Because I'm not showing you the actual design of the machine, right? I'm not telling you how the molecular motor works. I'm just saying there is something. All that machinery is stuffed into saying there is an off-diagonal kinetic coefficient. There is a kinetic coefficient. That, yes, just a minute. That, uh, So I told you it, N is number of fuel molecules consumed, right? None of these processes, none of these self-propelling processes can happen unless you have a way of converting stored energy, chemical energy, for example, into movement of some kind, right? So the picture, the cartoon I drew was basically, see, I mean, you can think of this as happening for any system. You don't even have to think chemistry. You can think that is one set of degrees of freedom. This is another set of degrees of freedom. I want a, I build a device which has all kinds of internal gears such that I turn things this way and there is some eccentric wheel and some, uh, you know, cam or whatever it is that turns this movement into this movement. One example is chemistry. But at this level, all of it is stuffed into two things. One, kinetic coefficients that mix, that, that give you forces in one direction due to that give you movement in one direction due to forces in another direction. Those forces in the examples we're going to be most interested in are chemical driving forces. Chemical driving force means you have it after any chemical reaction in principle, if you just have reactants in a container and everything is closed, on long enough time scales, you just have an equilibrium. But in practice, what happens is that some energy goes out and it's very hard to drive the reaction the other way. All we are saying here is, if you impose by hand that that reaction preferentially goes one way, by maintaining the chemical potential difference between reactants and products at a non-zero constant value, then on average the reaction will go on going one way. It's like tilting the, the you know, surface on which the chemistry is taking place in such a way that your reaction goes primarily one way. It's like every time one step of a reaction, one fuel molecule is consumed, you top up the fuel tank again. If you keep the fuel tank topped up, the reaction will preferentially go one way. Uh, this is all, if you, you can think of it as almost a metaphor for what happens there, but it's what it is, is a rendition in the simplest mathematical terms of what happens in that problem. Okay, and moreover, if there is such a coupling, that coupling is allowed to depend on the dynamical variables of, of the problem. And what I'm showing you is that given that this problem has an internal variable little x, and given that dp over dt is even in time reversal. And given that this is, again, a coordinate-like variable, this whole object has to be even under time reversal. Right? Because it's a coupling between... It's a coupling between... A, uh, it's a coupling to a coordinate-like variable. Okay? And so if you want a coupling to little x, this whole thing has to be a reversible term. Why? Because it depends on little x and n, and not on any of the momenta, not on any of the velocities. Right, again, you go back to this simple dynamics. There are two kinds of terms here. Let me write down the dynamics in the form P dot plus gamma del H over del P. You see that there are these terms. This is a momentum. This is P over M. It's odd under time reversal. This is X dot. It's odd under time reversal. This is reversible Hamiltonian dynamics. Likewise, this is P dot. This is del H over del X. This is even under time reversal. This is even under time reversal. Right? Because there's a P and a T here. This term has a P and no compensating time. This is odd under time reversal. So this is dissipated. Even. Reversible. Right? So this term, because we want it to contain an X and it contains an N, a uh, derivative with respect to N, this is even. So this is a reversible dynamical term. So this comes from 
the class of terms, I guess, that I've rubbed out. Uh, so all that's being said is one, you must have a coupling between the chemical and the physical the spatial degrees of freedom. Two, if that coupling doesn't depend on the internal coordinates, that will just introduce some constant term in the equations of motion. That, of course, is perfectly possible. But our interest is in understanding how to describe a self-propelling dimer in this language. And the way you do it is by allowing this term to depend on x. The simplest allowed dependence on x is linear in x. This contains this. It's not as though it's a derivation. This is really a restatement of the fact that a vectorial object, when held out of equilibrium, is going to start moving in some direction if there's a medium for it to push against. And this is just a way of rewriting that in this language. But it just tells you that it descends directly from ordinary large wing equation physics. OK, uh, you had a question, Zaptashi. OK, so let's now let's understand detail balance. The dynamics that I wrote down initially was detail balance respecting dynamics. Then what do I do? I deliberately hold this term constant, right? And now I'm in a state where I'm breaking detail balance. Why? Because I'm driving a chemical friction in one direction. So the, the dynamics about, so you create a stationary state in which on average you're going on eating fuel and going on moving in some direction. And that is a state of broken detail balance. So a way of saying this is the, you've got equilibrium dynamics. If you go even slightly off equilibrium, and you, you maintain the system slightly off equilibrium, you're in a state of broken detail balance. And you therefore then end up getting terms of this sort, which you wouldn't have in a detail balance respecting dynamics. That's all. Yeah. Tell me again. Right, right, right. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, but the point is, so now you might think, look, why is this different from a particle with momentum and inertia going in some direction and coming back? So in the next lecture, when we calculate entropy production, so it's actually a very important point. After all, if I had a thermal equilibrium particle in a potential with, and I keep track, kept track of inertia, it would also have dynamics that kind of looks like this. How can you tell the difference between this dynamics and equilibrium dynamics with inertia? How is persistent motion similar to and different from inertial motion? So we'll see that by calculating entropy production. And we'll see that in some cases, even though we know in our hearts that this is a driven problem, an effective equilibrium description will emerge. And in some other cases, it won't emerge. And we'll be able to calculate correlation, response, see how they're related. And in some cases, it will look equilibrium like in some it won't. So that's yeah. So somewhat rocky start to the lectures, but uh, 